Hello, I'm Veronika Kova. And today I'm going to talk about over the air Bluetooth low energy hacking. I have been in a security field for many years. And in 2018, I wanted to do something that I had not done before. And I started a company and has been focusing on researching Bluetooth security. And today I'm going to share my story from knowing almost nothing about Bluetooth to find the remote code vulnerabilities in the firmware level. And first, I started, uh, I started uh, the Bluetooth security by uh, surveying the existing uh, Bluetooth security researches. Then I read about Bluetooth specification, which is actually uh, pretty large, but I didn't read all of it. I generally focusing on the, the length field and embedded headers that uh, programmers likely make mistakes. Then I look for open uh, source implementations because sometimes documentation was uh, very vague. And for Bluetooth Classic, I couldn't find any open source implementation, but I found Zephyr and Apache Minute Nimble that is a Bluetooth low energy open source open source implementation. But today I'm going to uh, talk about mainly focusing on the BLE because that's the one that I has been focused on recently. And here there is a BLE stack and there are many protocols. And for the dual chip configuration, these protocols belong to host. And these two protocols belong to the BLE controller. And the specification define how HC uh, host controller interface should be implemented. Through the HCI, host generate, generate HCI commands to BLE controller. And BLE controller generate HCI events to send back the result to the host. And when it receive, uh, receive BLE packets, it also generate HCI events to the host. And for this here single chip configuration, this all protocols will be located on the BLE controller. But for this uh, configuration, the specification does not define how HCI should be implemented. So it is up to the implementer. They can use memory queue or they can choose just not having an explicit HCI layer. But this though, I will focus on this link layer. When I started this research in mid uh, 28, uh, 2018, there was literally zero, uh, zero controller specific vulnerabilities. But now there are 14 of them, including a BT classic and BLE vulnerabilities. Out of these 14, only, there are only three proven BLE RCE vulnerabilities. The first one you probably heard of is bleeding bit. And the two are the vulnerabilities I am going to talk about today. today. And let's see why an attacker is interested in finding these low layer vulnerabilities. Let's say an attacker found a PC specific vulnerability. For this case, the attacker can only attack a single class of the devices. But if an attacker find a vulnerability on this controller lay, uh, low layer, and this controller used for different classes of devices, he can attack PC, or he can attack car, medical devices, or IoT devices. And beyond that, this lower layer, uh, in order to attack this lower layer, it does not require either authentication or pairing. 
the attacker just needs to be nearby the device. And I'm going to talk about four vulnerabilities on this low layer today. I prepared demos for the two RC vulnerabilities, and I'll briefly explain two other uh, vulnerabilities. But before talking about the vulnerabilities, I wanted to talk about how I set up my lab in order to uh, start vulnerability hunting. And he here is a, a development board. I recommend to uh, start with the uh, development uh, dev, dev boards because it's easier to actually uh, find the vulnerability and make an exploit because development board, in many cases, you can do the hardware debugging. But just easy, it's easier to um, finding a vulner, uh, vulnerability and making an exploit compared to the end product. My lab has more than a dozen uh, dev boards, but I'm just showing you these two, two of them because I'm going to talk about it today. And there is here some serial com, uh, converters. Just if you have been, uh, if you have uh, some experience with the software development, it's just like a pre -nap. UART is the basic or uh, the easiest way to debug our hardware. And I happen to have one here, the leftmost one, this serial converter laying around in the house. And I use this one, however, it does not have a CTS and RTS li uh, lines. And it took me for a while to figure out even how to see the uh, UART messages. So I do recommend if you are getting the serial converter, get, uh, get ones that has a CTS and R RTS lines. And here is a uh, hardware debuggers. This here two upper ones are for OpenOCD. But using OpenOCD it requires slightly more work than the Sega J-Link debugger. I, for the beginners or the hobbyists, I recommend using this uh, Sega J-Link. For the hobbyists, you can use a, uh, this education license. However, for the uh, commercial, you have to get the commercial license. And since I'm a fuzzing dev boards, I had to have a way of power on and off these dev boards. So I used U-Hub control and then this here, the USB hub. So the fuzzer can turn it on and off the, uh, the, my target. And when you generate the arbitrary uh, BLD packets, there should be a way to actually look at them so you can confirm the packets are uh, generated properly. I use the Uber tools. This is very easy to use and it has a, a very uh, good display. However, it looks like the software has not been updated very recently, so it does not support newer uh, Bluetooth, pro uh, newer Bluetooth protocol features. And luckily, there are this sniffle was introduced at the end of the 2019 at hardware.io. And sniffle does support newer uh, Bluetooth specification, uh, Bluetooth protocol features. And here's a Nordic device. And I use the Nordic device in order to generate the arbitrary packets. I start with the NRF52 A32. It's because the Zephyr and Nimble has a lot of documentations and examples using this device. That is because the documentation was written a while ago and this one was an older dev board. The problem using this older one was in order to use UART, I had to connect my serial com converter to this, some of the individual GPIO. And it is kind of cumbersome when you move around this dev board, there's a multiple uh, cables coming out of it. So I end up using NRF5840. And the good thing about this board is it supports the virtual COM port. So you need only one USB cable. And with this uh, hardware, you need a software. And today I'm going to release a Jack B Nimble. Using this Jack Nimble software, you can generate an arbitrary BLE link layer packets. And 
it will be easy to extend to make your own fuzzer. Jackpin number come into the two parts. The first one is the formatter. I made a modification to the Nimble because uh, Nimble does not generate a packet that violates the Bluetooth specification, but we do want to, to generate the uh, packets that doesn't comply with the specification. And in order to this, uh, control this formatter, I made the uh, host code here. And this host code is written in Python, and this Python code is responsible for making these arbitrary packets and give it to the uh, formatter, and then the formatter will gonna send these packets. Now we have a lab set up, set up, then let's look at a specific chip. The first target is Texas Instrument WL1835 mod chip. And this chip supports Bluetooth version 4.2, and this case of development board was slightly different from other development board units in that it does not have hardware debugging uh, exposed. And also uh, on this in this chip, the BL link layer is baked into ROM, which means the end product that use this chip will have the same uh, ROM contents as this, this device, this development board. And the host or the end product, in order to uh, patch the functionality, uh, functionality bugs or the security vulnerabilities, it actually, uh, the host use a TI provided patch and redirect control a floor into the a different new code. And TI also provide uh, some tools for the developers. And one of them is a T, uh, HCI tester and logger. And what does this HCI tester does? I just mentioned about the patch file. And the patch file is in, the, is in binary format. And if you use the HCI tester, this uh, tool will translate this binary format to human readable strings. In the case of a logger, when I look at just the UART um, message traffic, the UR messages actually is in binary format. And if you attach this logo to the UR, this logo will display log messages in strings. And you, we, we just saw this diagram. In case of this uh, TI chip is belong to this uh, dual chip configuration. And in the demo, you will see uh, I actually generating some HCI commands in order to control this uh, TI uh, device. So now I have this development board and I just need to start from this, you know, just read the, uh, one dev board. So I open uh, this patch file using the uh, HCI tester and I could see there are many vendor specific write memory because the uh, patch file is in order to you know, patch uh, this, uh, this uh, chip. That means there can be a read memory. And I found a read memory in the, uh, one of the files that TI provides. And in the file, uh, next to the read memory, there was an opcode. I took that opcode and used the uh, HCI tool, which is a Linux tool. And I could dump the uh, accessible memory from uh, this uh, dev board. And one big uh, step I uh, could basically reverse this uh, formula better was I, after the identifying these log functions. I mentioned about the logger. So this log function uh, send these log messages in binary format to the UART. And based on this in colors of the, uh, basically looking at the uh, colors of this log function, I could identify some of the function names and then some code context. And here's an example. When I just open the formatter, I just um, dump the memory with the IDA, there is not, no information because there's no symbols. But here, this function, turns out to be one of the log wrapper functions. And the first argument 
is the uh, log string ID. And after uh, identifying these uh, many log function, like a log wrapper functions, I could see that this particular wrapper set the uh, log level to two. There is a, a level from one to six, and it expects two parameters uh, for the uh, log format string here, because it expected two parameters here. And for the ID, once it, this function takes this ID, it adds 3580 to this number, and, the, and then figure it out, it needs to basically use this string. And based on this string, now I can see the function here name is this, uh, this string, the perform command. By uh, and I made a IDA script to repeat this process. And now I have a lot of uh, static analysis information. However, in many cases, this is not enough to actually identify the uh, vulnerability or the actually exploit the vulnerability. So I made a forger. I mentioned about the JackP Nimble. So JackP Nimble is a basically code that extracted from this forger. And while I was generating arbitrary packet and when I crashed the device, the information I'm looking at was not enough. And I will show you an example in the next slide. So I reverse engineered, uh, no, I actually read the uh, hard, fault, hard fault handler code and they found that there is a flag in the memory. If I set the flag, I could see way more information. And also, uh, if you have, I have a way of hardware, hardware debugging. I can just check the register values or the memory values on the fly. But since I don't have that, I patch this binary in order to read some register values or the memory address values. And here's an example of the logger. Here, if I don't patch any uh, binary at all, this is a default uh, case, what you can see in the logger. And this particular case is why I was making the proof of concept code. And I actually overwrote the PC value, which we're gonna trigger the hard fault. And in here, just it uh, re repeat the similar information here, uh, just repeatedly. So now I patch the binary. And let's look at the first uh, patch here. And this one actually shows the uh, uh, just before step buffer overflow occurs. And here, you don't need to worry about this uh, log string here. I just pick a um, string ID that takes two parameters. This is the informa uh, important information. So I wanted to uh, print out what's the uh, source address and what's the length value for the mem copy. And here, when I print out, it's a heap address. And please remember this one because when I talk about the actual vulnerability, I will mention this source address again, and also this length value here. And I hook the code just before mem copy is uh, called. And another patch I've done is I mentioned about the fault, uh, hard fault handler, and I set the flag to one so I can see more information at the time of the crash. So now it, I see the all the register values and the stack information, and in the following so there is a heap memory information as well. And now let's talk about the uh, the vulnerability that uh, end to remote code execution. Uh, actually, I found this uh, integer on the floor very while uh, very long ago when I uh, disassembled this firmware, I identified the mem copy first and looked around the all the callers. And I could identify this integer on the floor right away, and which can yield to the uh, stack buffer overflow. But at the time, I didn't have a way of uh, just reaching this code path. So, but after I making the fuzzer, I could I was able to crash the device, and then I could see the uh, the actual vulnerability can be reachable and the exploitable. And guess what? This mistake is exactly actually same as bleeding bit but in the different code base. In the case of bleeding bit, it was a heap overflow flow, but mine is a stack overflow, which means an attacker can uh, exploit this more reliably. 
And let's see it when attack actually takes place. A victim started scanning, then attacker here, you can just send a malicious, of malicious advertisement packet. And you, as you see here, neither the authentication nor the uh, pairing required. Just scanning and malicious packet, that's it. And now let's take a look at the assembly code. In this function, as you see here, the uh, function allocate a uh, stack buffer space for hex to C. And the next is the, uh, I actually skip a little bit of instruction here because it was just irrelevant. This R6 value is a PDU length. PDU is like a packet data unit length. And then I will show you the format in the very next slide. It take the uh, length of value and subtract six here. Here, there is an integer on the floor. If R6 value is, is smaller than six, this end up uh, R6 here becomes really big number. But next instruction is, is unsigned by extension, which means it will eliminate the three most significant bytes and then leave only the last uh, least significant byte alone here. And I want you to actually remember this part, why I'm emphasizing, because when I talk about on another, my dose, uh, dose vulnerability, this actually a big, uh, play a big role here, this uh, instruction. And this R6 become here, length is a big number, it goes to the length field. And the next R1, if you remember from the previous slide, one of the previous slide, this R5 value has the uh, heap buffer address here. Oops, let's see here. It goes to here, the source address. And destination address here is a stack address here. So you see there is a stack buffer overflow. And this is how this packet looks, advertisement packet looks like. This length field here, version, uh, this is from the version 4.2. This six bit comes here, and which is the R6 value. And if I put a less than six, then there is an integer on the flow. And let's see why the programmer make those kind of mistake. According to, to uh, according to the stack version 4.2, there are seven uh, PDO types, and all of them has at least actually six byte data here. So programmer programmer can think as okay, there is a packet length, I can just subtract six. However, if an, it is a uh, malicious packet, uh, it can be smaller than the six. Now I started developing the exploits. But then the problem is, was because of the background BLE traffic, I could not control this uh, heap contents. Uh, real, uh, I could not uh, control the heap contents well in order to make a reliable exploit. So I come up with an attack. It's a quiet place attack. There are lots of uh, those attack, uh, those vulnerability, including one of mine, and any unsuccessful uh, attack can be a DOS attack. Let's see here, there is an attacker and he, he wants to attack this BLE controller. But now he sees a lot of uh, nearby uh, device, BLE devices and he wants to quiet them down. Then you can just kill all of them using the DOS attack. Then finally, this attacker can just send a malicious packet targeting this victim. Now, here is a thing. I'm not a real attacker, and I cannot kill the old neighbor's BLE devices. So my solution is, I have a bucket, a paint bucket. I made a Faraday cage out of this paint bucket. And here, in order to reduce the uh, background uh, BLE noise, this is the uh, uh, RF shielding fabric and I wrap my div uh, these devices using the uh, tin foil. And I also actually, when I uh, wrap these old devices into the bucket, I put the Uber to here in order to verify actually the uh, background noise has been reduced. And let's take a look at the uh, demo. 
I set up my uh, JP Nimble here and attack, I'm going to attack this TI device. Before launching an attack, I'm going to show you nearby BLE devices. And you don't see anything with the name Pond, but one of my neighbor has a smart refrigerator. And I'm going to use btmon to show HCI command and uh, events to just see the states of the victim. And I'm going to attach the victim device to this host. And here, as you see, the host use old patch in order to initialize the victim. So this a device still vulnerable. Now I'm going to uh, command uh, for the victim to start scanning using the uh, HCI tool here and launching the attack over the air uh, from an actually a different machine. Uh, now you see the uh, some HCI event and it actually just uh, reporting the received packets to the host and uh, the attack actually succeeded because when I scan nearby device again, you see pawn, but this victim supposed to be scanning only. Okay, now let's take a look at the uh, um, next vulnerability. When I report the uh, first bug to the TI, I actually made a POC that overriding the uh, a program counter to the 41, 41, 41, 41. I thought this basically, this vulnerability uh, making the POC for this vulnerability will be just, you know, very simple. Just you're going to be very similar to the first one. Because when you see this code, the uh, programmers mistake is exactly the same. There is on the floor, which will want to cause the stack uh, buffer overflow. However, it turns out to be uh, you, uh, uh, the, man uh, the manipulating the heat contents was a bit harder. So for now, it is a potential RC, but uh, at some point I will make a POC for this uh, vulnerability. The difference uh, this uh, bug from the, the first one is uh, victim should be in the active scanning. And the victim will receive all this uh, advertisement, uh, advertisement just like passive scanning. Then victim will generate the uh, scan request in order to get more information. But at the time, the attacker can generate a malicious scan response. In the same case, it does not require either authentication or pairing. And here, this PDO type is four and length just need to be smaller than the six. Now let's look at the next target. Next target is Silicon Labs EFR 32MG21 chip. I picked this chip because it supports Bluetooth 5 extended advertisement. And this development board also supports hardware debugging. And Silicon Lab provides an SDK, and this SDK comes with a Bluetooth stack in library format. And luckily, this library has some symbols. And this Silicon Lab chip is uh, one of these uh, single chip configuration uh, case. So all these protocols reside on the controller device. So when I show you the demo, you will not see any interaction between the host and the controller through this uh, HCI interface. And now I just started fuzzing extended advertisement packets. And it, but I ran into a problem because it turns out I initially when I make the fuzzer, I initially use a Zephyr. But then the Zephyr turns out is not uh, supporting the extended advertisement yet. So I had to uh, change my code to use a Nimble. And right after I was in extended ad advertisement, I uh, found a dose bug right away. Then I was more, couple more, couple of days, but there was no crash. So I was wondering whether my fuzz are actually generating the package properly or not and found that there was a case. 
I use the Uber tools to see the uh, packets, but Uber tools does not uh, support its extended advertisement packet or the uh, very long length advertisement packet. So I couldn't see this, you know, my generated call. So, but luckily there was Sniffle, which is supposed supports the extended advertisement packets. So when I use a sniffle, I could not see any of my packets. And it turns out when I debug the Nimble and it turns out, turns out Nimble actually does not allocate enough uh, time to send really long length advertisement packets. So I modified the Nimble, then I found a crash almost right away, which yields to an RC bug. So before looking at the RC bug, I wanted to mention about my DOS bug because I wanted to point it out that not every memory bug for overflow will end up as an RC bug. Here is a, a DOS bug. I want you to just focus this here a little bit. This R2 and RC, R6 will going to have a length value that is uh, attacker can control. And since there is an integer on the floor, on the flow, they will, R2 value will become really big number. But the difference from uh, the previous uh, bug is, in the previous bug, there was a uh, unsigned byte extension. Because of this, this really big number, four byte number, becomes just one byte. But this vulnerable code here does not have any of this before calling the mem move. So when mem move called, with this big number, it will end up as a memory access violation. And the chances that you know, the attacker can interrupt this mem move is really slim. So I call this bug as a DOS bug. Now let's move on to the hip of overflow, which is an RC bug. And explaining this hip, uh, any, any hip of overflow quickly verbally is hard, so I'll give you a really big picture here. When uh, this uh, silage uh, chip received a uh, packet, it actually chopped into the uh, uh, smaller chunks, which is smaller chunks actually length is weird, actually is like a hex 45, which is an interesting number. And it maintains a chain buffer. While it's maintaining this chain buffer, a programmer, programmer made a mistake and I could actually end up overriding a mem memory chunk boundary and I could overwrite this you know, memory chunks uh, metadata pointer. And after that, I could overwrite the uh, function pointer, which is to a remote code execution. I report this one to Scilab on uh, February 21st, and they fixed uh, March 3rd, uh, 20th, which is very impressive speed. And let's look at the uh, what attack packet looks like. Here is the uh, See, this is the uh, uh, advertisement header, and the, this is the uh, extended advertisement type. And there is a nested header here. And I could use this uh, length here and to set to 30, uh, hex 3C, which actually triggered some miscalculation. And if you want to know the details, please read uh, my white paper and the white paper will describe in detail. And let's look at the uh, RC persistent demo. I set up my uh, JetB Nimble here and this JetB Nimble will send a malicious packet over the air and we will attack the controller and you will persist. I'm going to connect GDB to the victim device, you know, to just see the state of the device. And the client is connecting to the GDB server. And I'm starting the uh, Uber tools to see the uh, BLD traffic. And I'm starting uh, generating the malicious packets over the air from the different machine. And you here, you see this still here, uh, advertisement. This victim is supposed to be scanning on it. And this share code, what it does is once it uh, 
exploit the device, it reset the device. Now I'm going to turn off this uh, victim device. And it's a little bit slow because I was recording and I was typing as well. Now I'm going to clear uh, this left lower screen in order to show that uh, when device, the victim device is off, you will not see any advertisement traffic coming out of the victim device. Now I'm restarting the uh, overtooth. And the one you just seeing is just a, a random background traffic. And I'm going to uh, turn on the device again. Now you still see this advertisement packet that proves that the uh, exploit persists on the device. Now I will briefly explain general Bluetooth security challenges. Just like most other embedded systems, it lacks common exploit mitigations. What it means is it is easier for an attacker to exploit devices in the wild. And also, chip vendors often do not support secure board or secure reset. What it means is if an attacker successfully exploits a device, he can persist on the device. And what does it mean it's easy to exploit and easy to persist? What is the impact of it? Well, it turns out it's very hard to assess the uh, complete impact of uh, any security findings. That is because it is hard to identify end product they use a particular chip. And also it is difficult to identify different classes of devices a certain uh, chip is being used either. And just like any other businesses, the customer information is a secret. And it will be up to the vendor to notify any security findings to their customers. And even one worst case is an end, pro, uh, end product manufacturer may use a middleman, a package a provider. In this, if there is this kind of chain, it is less likely this any security findings information is be propagated down this chain. So this is all time I got today. And for any additional information, you can check out at the GitHub in this URL. I wanted to thank Zeno, Rafael, and Marian for their valuable feedback, and thank you for watching my talk.